Hi there, my friends. Welcome to the Unfolding Restoration. My name is Anthony Sweat. I'm so grateful you've joined me at this video, and I hope that it can be uh, helpful and beneficial to you. The purpose of this video series, as I've said in other videos, is to talk about how the gospel of Jesus Christ was restored through the prophet Joseph Smith, line upon line, and precept upon precept. This is video 14, where I want to talk about how that idea happened with the School of the Prophets uh, and the Kirtland Endowment, how Joseph grew in this idea of endowment and temple and trying to prepare a people to come into the presence of God uh, little by little. Oh man, it is fascinating. So I hope you're excited and, and ready to rock and roll. Uh, I need to back up uh, from the Kirtland period. We need to back all the way up to when the church was uh, newly organized. It had only been organized uh, for about seven months. And in December of 1830, a revelation came to Joseph Smith found in section 37 of your Doctrine and Covenants. In that revelation, the New York and Pennsylvania saints are told that they need to go gather with all the saints in Ohio. Now, this was a huge sacrifice. They wondered why, and they questioned it. In January of 1831, a conference was held where they talked about it. That was the, the major thing on their mind. Why should we gather to Ohio? And that is now section 38 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And in that revelation given to Joseph at that conference, the Lord says the word endowment for the first time in this dispensation that we know of. He said to those saints that if they would go and gather and sell their farms and sacrifice and consecrate and be obedient and go to Ohio, the Lord said, quote, you should go to the Ohio, and there I will give unto you my law, and there you shall be endowed with power from on high." End of quote. Well, Joseph immediately obeys this revelation, and by February the next month in 1831, he has gathered to Ohio. Most of the New York uh, and uh, Pennsylvania saints, to their credit, they sell their farms or leave them and uproot, and by the summer of 1831, they've gathered to Ohio. So now that they're there, they are ready to receive this endowment, this endowment of power. Now, when I say the word endowment, uh, we always have to be careful in the church because words are, are just loaded uh, with meaning. And when I say endowment, you likely think of the rituals or the ceremony or the presentation of the endowment, uh, an ordinance that goes on in the temple. That is not what was being talked about in 1831. I want you to put that definition on hold for a little bit, and I want you to use a different, different definition of endowment. The definition that I want you to think about and use uh, is more of a classic, I know it's nerdy that in Latter-day Saint talks that we kick off with the dictionary defines, but it's actually helpful here. Uh, uh, endowment is defined as many things, but one of them is a natural gift and ability or a quality. We're used to saying the endowment is a gift. My question is, it's a gift of what? Well, if I say it's an ability, now it starts to expand us. It's an ability to do what? Or a quality or a capacity. A capacity to do what? That's what Joseph's getting at in the summer of 1831 when the church gathers there to be endowed. Well, they hold a conference. It's known as the June 1831 conference. They hold it on the Isaac Morley farm uh, right there outside of Kirtland, Ohio. Isaac Morley has this large farm that a number of people are living on, and he has this little uh, log schoolhouse that they hold school in for all these families that live there. And they gather together, about 60 men, 60 elders gather in this little log schoolhouse on the Isaac Morley property. And they sit on slab wooden benches, and Joseph stands up and starts to teach them and he tells them that he is there to endow them. I might be so bold as to say the first endowment in this dispensation did not happen in the Kirtland Temple nor in the Nauvoo Temple. The first endowment in this dispensation took place in the Isaac Morley Log Schoolhouse and the June 1831 Conference of the Church. Now, uh, John Corll, who was present, he remembered that they gathered their quote, that they might receive an endowment. And again, don't jump to, oh, that Joseph did this ceremony with them. He didn't do that there. 
He's trying to give them ability, power, and capacity. The question is, what ability, what power, and what capacity? Well, he was trying to give them the ability, power, and capacity of ancient high priests or the ancient apostles. Joseph had been translating the Bible beginning in the summer of 1830, and he had learned that there were great high priests like Enoch and like Melchizedek or like Isaiah in the Book of Mormon, like the brother of Jared. He learned that these great high priests had power and capacity, uh, that they had power to rend the veil, that they could see God and behold visions and come into God's presence. They had power to tell mountains to move and have the elements obey them. They had power to perform miracles and raise the dead and experience spiritual gifts. Uh, they had power, even like Enoch, to set at defiance the armies of nations. Joseph is trying to infuse these men, these common farmers, as they sit on slab wooden benches in the Isaac Morley schoolhouse with that kind of a power. Ezra Booth, who was there, who later apostatizes and leaves the church, he recollected that at that conference they were, quote, ordained to the high priesthood or the order of Melchizedek, and they were to be endowed with the same power as the ancient apostles were. John Corll, who was at this conference of June 1831, said, the Melchizedek priesthood chiefly consisted of the endowment, it being a new order and bestowed authority. So, sometimes we simplify the June 1831 conference to say that Joseph is simply ordaining the first high priests of this dispensation, as though it was some sort of a priesthood ecclesiastical church office that we will use for bishops and stake presidents later and high councilmen. That all comes later. That's not his motive. He is literally saying, I want to lay my hands on your head and infuse you with power and authority and make you great high priests like Melchizedek was. Uh, that's what he's doing. He wants them to stand in the presence of God and be after the order of Melchizedek or like Melchizedek. Thus, he's going to say that he restored the Melchizedek priesthood or Melchizedek's order at the June 1831 conference. Don't confuse that with the uh, 1829 Peter, James, and John, Keys of the Kingdom, Melchizedek Priesthood. If you're confused with that, go back and watch my video on priesthood so that you understand that. He's trying to get them to live after the order of the Son of God, the order of Melchizedek, to become great high priests. He turned to the men. People recollected that Joseph said that, quote, not three days should pass away before some of you should see the Savior face to face. Could you imagine being at a conference when the prophet promised you that over those three days of the conference, if you're faithful, that you'll get to see God? Or as Levi Hancock recollected, Joseph simply said to the people there, you will see the Lord. You'll have heaven opened up to you. And after Joseph ordained these uh, men high priests, they experienced a range of phenomenon. They experienced some dark, and, and Satan made an appearance and tried to, uh, to, to thwart the meeting but they also experienced grand visions. Some of them even said they saw not just Jesus. There's reports at the June 1831 conference of some seeing the Father and the Son. Some of those were people like Harvey Whitlock and Lyman White. Uh, Lyman White, after he was set apart as a high priest, uh, quote, stepped out on the floor and said, I now see God and Jesus Christ at his right hand. Harvey Whitlock reportedly, quote, saw the heavens open and Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father. And then he recollected this was the beginning in our day of ordinations to the office of a high priest, end of quote. I've done this painting here of the June 1831 conference, and in this painting you see Joseph standing in the Isaac Morley schoolhouse pointing up to the Father and the Son who he's hoping to reveal and have these people see. Uh, some of the men in the crowd are looking up as though they are seeing and experiencing these visions, this high priestly power. Others are asleep, uh, like this guy here, and others uh, are incredulous. Maybe they doubt, maybe they fear, like these two men in the corner who appear to be talking to each other. 
it's the same with endowment today, I, in my opinion. Uh, some experience it, uh, some are asleep to it, and some doubt or question that it's a real power and capacity. But some of the people there didn't experience much of anything heavenly. Their, their endowment experience uh, wasn't overly grand. Well, why? Well, the Lord gives a revelation um, in November, but just before this revel that I want to touch on in a second, but in October of 1831, just a few months later, Joseph Smith said this, quote, the order of the high priesthood, which is beginning at the June 1831 conference a few months before, is that they have power given them to seal up the saints unto eternal life, and that, quote, could we all come together with one heart and one mind in perfect faith, the veil might as well be rent today as next week or any other time, and if we will but cleanse ourselves and covenant before God to serve him, it's our privilege. So, you're seeing that the men weren't quite ready, but that they could experience this endowment, this power, if they would make covenants, if they would get ready and be sanctified, that if they would come together in one heart and one mind and live more Zion-like, they could come into the presence of God. That will lead to a revelation the next month in November. Look at section 67. You see it's November of 1831. Look at verse 3. Ye endeavored to believe that ye should receive the blessing which was offered unto you. What blessing? Well, the blessing of endowment, the blessing of high priesthood, the blessing to come into the presence of God and experience his power and capacity. But behold, verily I say unto you, there were fears in your heart, and verily this is the reason ye did not receive. Then he goes off for a little bit about some of their other issues with how they're doubting Joseph's revelations and how they're written and expressed. But now jump back to verse 10. And again, verily I say unto you that it is your privilege and a promise I give unto you. I'm going to come back to that because section 88 is going to reference this promise, this high priestly promise from God. And a promise I give unto you that have been ordained unto this ministry, that inasmuch as ye strip yourselves from jealousies and fears and humble yourselves before me, for ye are not sufficiently humble, the veil shall be rent and you shall see me and know that I am, not with the carnal, neither natural mind, but with the spiritual. For no man has seen God at any time in the flesh except quickened by the Spirit of God. Neither can any natural man abide the presence of God, neither after the carnal mind. You see what he's teaching here? You and I can't live worldly and carnally and expect to be endowed with power and expect to become like great high priests. Um, and expect to come into the presence of God. So, look what he says in verse 13. You are not able to abide the presence of God now, neither the ministering of angels. Wherefore, continue in patience until ye are perfected. Let not your minds turn back. Don't give up on this promise. And when ye are worthy, in my own due time, ye shall see and know that which was conferred upon you by the hands of my servant, Joseph Smith, Jr. That context is directly referencing the June 1831 conference, high priesthood, and, the, and seeking after uh, endowment. Now, with that context, now Joseph is left with, well, how do I help these men overcome their fears and strip themselves of jealousies and pride and become more holy? And how do I get them to covenant with each other and, and learn how to come unto God? Well, God says, I have an answer. I want you to organize this thing called the School of the Prophets. Now, you've likely heard of the School of the Prophets before, and it's probably been put in the context of almost like a missionary training center. I think that is appropriate, and uh, section 88, uh, there are verses that, that treat it that way. But I, I want you to focus in on the, the title, School of the Prophets. It was a school to help people become like prophets. We could rephrase it and call it the school of the Melchizedeks and the school of the Enochs, or in this context, I would rephrase it and call it the school of the high priests, the, the school of the future Isaiahs, the school of the future Adam and later in Nauvoo, also the school of future priestesses, the, the school of Eves as well. Section 88, by the way, is the revelation telling Joseph to organize this school, and section 88 is what calls it the school of the prophets. Go to section 88 and look at verse 67. You know how... Um, Sometimes you walk into, into schools, modern schools today, and they'll often have like their mission statement up, you know, 
Well, the School of the Prophets, they didn't have a banner hung up, but if they did have a mission statement of what they were trying to do in this school, I believe it's in verse, um, section 88, verses 67 to 69, verse 69 in particular. Uh, the Lord says this, let me get there. I'm going to back up and then I'll show you. In verse 67, if your eye be single to my glory, your whole body shall be filled with light. And then look at verse 68, therefore, sanctify yourselves that your minds become single to God and the days will come that you shall see him for he will unveil his face unto you and it shall be in his own time and in his own way and according to his own will remember the great and last promise which I have made unto you. That, that is their mission statement to become more holy if I had to put it on a banner the school of the high priests or the school of the Melchizedeks or the school of the prophets was trying to sanctify a group of men so that they could achieve endowment and gain the power and capacity of great high priests to perform miracles, to experience miracles, to know God, to come into his presence, to know how to commune with him, to know how to ask and receive answers. So with that understanding, you start to see what God's going to do next. And I hope you're mentally making some ties into the idea of endowment as a whole. In verse 74 and 75, he tells them to organize this school of prophets so that the great and last promise can be fulfilled. He then is going to start giving them some specific requirements to achieve endowment. Now, we saw one of the first ones right there in verse 69. Look back in verse 69. Cast away your idle thoughts and your excesses of laughter far from you. Call a solemn assembly. So, may have a sacred solemn meeting. Um, get away from light-mindedness and, and inappropriate laughter. Now jump to verse 119 in section 88. The Lord says this, again, organize yourself, prepare every, every needful thing, establish a house, even a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God. So this endowment needs, this solemn assembly and endowment needs to take place in a sacred space that we're going to call a house of God or a temple. Look at verse 120. When you come into this temple, you need to learn how to approach God in the name of the Lord, the end of verse 20, with uplifted hands to the Most High. You need to get rid of your light speeches from all laughter. And by the way, that doesn't mean that we don't laugh, that we don't have a healthy sense of humor. I interpret that to mean that we don't have inappropriate, mocking, uh, crude, unclean, uh, poorly timed laughter. That when we're serious and somber and sacred, that we let things be sacred and we treat them sacredly. Get rid of your lustful desires in verse 121 from all your pride and light-mindedness, from all your wicked doings. Look at verse 123. See that ye love one another. Cease to be covetous. Learn to impart to one another as the gospel requires. Cease to be idle and cease to be unclean. Cease to find fault with one another who, by the way, in this context, were church leaders uh, as a whole. And I hope you guys are seeing something there a pattern or an order. When we, when we talk about the order of the Son of God, an, another word for order could be a, a type of living, a society, a group of people, a pattern to approach God and to be endowed was starting to be revealed. Live the law of chastity, be obedient, be consecrated, get rid of light-mindedness, inappropriate laughter, fault-finding. You can do these things and you'll start to – and bind yourself to these things by a covenant. And if you bind yourself this way and start to live this way, you'll start to gain power and capacity in your life to know God, to come unto him, to have his power with you. You see how beautiful this is? And I hope this is giving you some insight into the endowment today. Section 88, by the way, says you also have to be worthy before you're going to enter into this school of future high priests and priestesses, this school of elders, this school of future prophets. And section 88 says that Joseph, or the leader of the school, was supposed to meet them at the door and to do a worthiness check. Uh, section 88 says that they were supposed to lift up their hands and say, 
art thou a brother or a brethren, as this uh, illustration that I have here shows. I salute you as a token of the everlasting covenant. And they have this whole long introduction. The person would hold up their hands and repeat it back, or they could say amen. They wanted to make sure they were worthy um, uh, to be in there. So how do you get initiated into this school of the prophets, or how do you join it? Well, section 88 tells Joseph uh, and the school of the prophets what to do. Section 88, verse 138, ye shall not receive any among you into this school, save he is clean from the blood of this generation. Well, how do you get clean from the blood of this generation? Look at verse 139, and he shall be received by the ordinance of the washing of feet, for unto this end was the ordinance of the washing of feet instituted. Joseph said that this washing of the feet was meant to unite their hearts and meant to be an emblem of like how the Savior washed the feet of the apostles uh, on the night that he was uh, crucified. And so that is what joined them in uh, to this school or initiated them into this school of the prophets. So they start to hold the school of the prophets there, trying to achieve endowment. And let me just read you this recollection. It's a late reminiscence from Zebedee Coltrane, but he was there. He says, quote, at one of these meetings after the organization of the school, the school being organized on the 23rd of January, 1833, when we were all together, Joseph having given instructions and while engaged in silent prayer and kneeling with our hands uplifted, each one praying in silence, no one whispered above his breath, a personage walked through the room from east to west, and Joseph asked if we saw him. I saw him and suppose the others did, and Joseph answered, that is Jesus, the Son of God, our elder brother. Afterward, Joseph told us to resume our former position in prayer, which we did. Another person came through. He was surrounded as with a flame of fire. I experienced a sensation that it might destroy the tabernacle, as it was of consuming fire of great brightness. The prophet Joseph said, this was the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I saw him. The prophet Joseph said, brethren, now you are prepared to be the apostles of Jesus Christ, for you have seen both the Father and the Son. Wow. Now, again, remember, that's tying into endowment, high priestly, apostolic power and experiences to know God and be able to represent him uh, to others. So, over the next few years, they labor and they labor diligently to build this Kirtland Temple, and I can't harness and evoke words well enough, eloquent enough, to summarize their sacrifice between 1833 and 1836 to build the Kirtland Temple. That building is marvelous. It is beautiful. Every time I've been there in person, I have marveled at it. I love it. I am so grateful to our sisters and brothers of the Community of Christ for their care of that building. Um, that sacred historic building for us. Bear in mind that the saints in Kirtland, it's about the size of a regular Latter-day Saint stake today. There's only a few thousand members in Kirtland total, and they are poor. Imagine a poor stake of a few thousand people building that building. Wow. When this temple was almost completed in January of 1836, Joseph is going to call for some solemn assemblies to be held in the upper rooms of the Kirtland Temple. Um, and it's, it's not dedicated yet, but he, he calls different priesthood leaders and he holds multiple meetings there. The prophet promised a few weeks earlier when he writes, telling people to come to these meetings, listen to this, quote, concerning the endowment, all who are prepared and are sufficiently pure to abide the presence of the Savior will see him. That's what he promises them in the Kirtland Temple. To prepare them, the prophet and others, quote, attended to the ordinance of washing our bodies in pure water, end of quote. In other words, they applied the earlier revelation to wash the feet to the whole body, uh, to cleanse the whole body as an ordinance to be clean before the Lord. They used what the Word of Wisdom instructed them in section 89, that alcohol is meant for the washing of the bodies. And they made a, 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 a quote, sweet smelling, odorous wash, end of quote, according to Oliver Cowdery. And, and they added cinnamon and other things in there. And they used that to wash their bodies. One person said that as, as their bodies were washed and cleansed, 
that having the alcohol almost lift off them and dry, felt like their sins were being lifted off their body. Very beautiful and uh, ritual, in, in my opinion. They're also told to put on uh, clean, decent clothing uh, for it. Now, when they come to these meetings, having been washed and clothed and ready, they go there to attend, quote, the ordinance of anointing our heads with holy oil to, quote, pronounce the blessings of heaven, end of quote, upon each other. That's how Joseph says. So they also anoint each other when they get to this meeting. Oliver Cowdery recollected that this washing and anointing was, quote, in the manner that were Moses and Aaron and those who stood before the Lord in ancient days, end of quote. Uh, W.W. Phelps is the one who writes a letter to his wife, Sally. W.W. Phelps has been invited to this meeting. He writes Sally, quote, our meetings will grow more and more solemn and will continue till our great solemn assembly when the house is finished. We are preparing to make ourselves clean by first cleansing our hearts, forsaking our sins, forgiving everybody, putting on clean, decent clothes by anointing our heads and by keeping all the commandments. That's a great summary of how they're trying to achieve endowment there in Kirtland. By the way, at the Kirtland Temple, when it is dedicated, W. W. Phelps writes the hymn of the Spirit of God. There's another verse to it that uh, we often, that's not in our current hymn book, that was in the original. It's verse 4 that they had that I have right here. It says, will wash and be washed and with oil be anointed with all not omitting the washing of feet. For he that receiveth his penny appointed must surely be clean at the harvest of, of wheat. We'll sing and we'll shout. Beautiful thing connected to the ordinances that they were doing in the Kirtland Temple. Thus being prepared, uh, being taught, covenanted, washed, clothed, anointed, Joseph prepares and he proceeds to, quote, instruct them to call upon God with uplifted hands to seal the blessings which had been promised to them by the holy anointing, end of quote. And they expected through all of this to have this outpouring of heavenly power, which is exactly what happened. They were endowed in the Kirtland Temple. After the washing and anointing and blessing each other in these January 1836 meetings, Joseph writes, quote, the vision of heaven was open to these also, those who were there. Some of them saw the face of the Savior, and others were ministered unto by holy angels, and the spirit of prophecy and revelation was poured out in mighty power, and loud hosannas and glory to God in the highest saluted the heavens, for we all communed with the heavenly hosts, and I saw in my vision all of the presidency in the celestial kingdom of God and many others uh, who were present. Joseph summarized this whole thing, this whole season, as, quote, the Savior made his appearance to some while angels ministered to others, and it was a Pentecost and endowment or endowment indeed long to be remembered. And part of this, as you know, and I'm not going to go into this in this video, in section 110, the Savior appears to Joseph and Oliver in the Kirtland Temple. So does Moses and Elias and Elijah conferring upon them priesthood ordinances and keys and authority, the gospel and dispensation of Abraham, the sealing power, etc. Okay, as I conclude this video, I hope that you've made some connections. I hope that you have begun to make uh, some relations to the endowment today. Now, speaking reverently and respectfully uh, in, in a public video, uh, all I want to say is that there is a difference between endowment and the presentation of the endowment. The things that Joseph learns line upon line, precept upon precept, through these Kirtland years, beginning in June of 1831, all the way through the School of the Prophets in 1833, on to the School of the Elders and the dedication of the Kirtland Temple in 1836, those things lay the foundation for what will later become the presentation of the endowment in Nauvoo, to package all of that together into a series of ordinances and covenants and teachings uh, to help you and I become endowed with power and capacity. But I want to emphasize there's a difference between endowment and the presentation of the endowment. The presentation is a method 
It is a sacred ritual. It's a presentation of concepts. But the endowment is a power and a capacity and an ability. What power, capacity, and ability is it? The power and capacity of great high priests and priestesses, the power and capacity of holy people who have entered into the order of the Son of God or the order of Melchizedek, who know how to commune with God, who know how to receive revelation, who know how to receive and call upon his power in their daily life, who know how to perform miracles to minister and to serve others, who know how to covenant and commit to God um, and follow his Son in sacred and holy ways. I hope that this helps illuminate a little bit as you and I seek the power of endowment in our life today, line upon line and precept upon precept as we grow into our understanding and ability to do so as the restoration continues and it unfolds for you and for I. God bless you and God bless me as we do so.